And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. Today, I'm super proud, super excited to have with me the man, the legend, that is Christopher Lockhead. Welcome to the Matt Brown Show, dude. Thank you very much. Yeah, I got, I got you to ring the bell. I'm stoked. <sighs> he can actually see the bell. The bell is everything, really. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of bells and gongs. Gongs, really? We should get a gong. We should totally. Yeah, get I a gong. think when you close a big sale, somebody needs to hit a gong. Right. Put that on the OPEX list, please. Thanks very much, budget <laughs> for that. Um, and so, Chris, um, thanks so much, man. I've been really looking forward to this. It's been like literally months in the making. When when did we actually first connect? It was probably like three months ago. I don't. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. I texted uh, the wonderful Candy Dandy this morning. I'm like, where where did we meet, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> when did this begin? Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, I know where it began. It began with me reading your books, which we can dive into or, or not. Um, but uh, but I guess I must say that, um, and this team, we have a, obviously our live audience here, but um, our, um, our company has been really shaped massively by, uh, by you know, your thinking in your two books, Play Bigger and Niche Down. And, uh, you know, we've borrowed and bastardized a lot of the thinking. And I can say that, you know, with hand on heart, it's we've literally seen such incredible growth. Um, you know, we've quadrupled in size in the last sort of six months. We're you know literally scaling up, um, and it's fucking exciting. And I think a lot of that really wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't come across your book. So I just wanted to say thanks. Wow, Matt, I'm blown away to hear that. Uh, even if you're exaggerating, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> I always embellish. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it takes one to know one, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Marketer to marketer, ching ching. But um, for those of you who don't know who Chris Lockhead is, why don't you give us the headline backstory there, bud? What do we need to know? Set us off. Uh, the, the quick story is um, I got thrown out of school at 18 for being stupid. Uh, I found out later at 21 that I'm, I have dyslexia and dyscalculia and a whole bunch of those things. I wrap them all together and call it dysfuclea. Um, <laughs> But at 18 years old, uh, uh, like a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, for me, entrepreneurship was a way out, not just a way up. Mm. And like a lot of other entrepreneurs, you know, I didn't necessarily choose entrepreneurship per se. Uh, but when you find yourself, particularly as a young person, where nobody will bet on you, and in my case, the choice was kind of manual labor or start a company. Mm. And not that there's anything wrong with manual labor. I've done lots of it in my life, but, um, you know, I wanted more. And so given nobody else would bet on me with no money, no experience, no education and no relationships, uh, me and my buddy Jack said, fuck it, let's start a company. And so I was 18 when that happened. Um, uh, fast forward, I ended up uh, starting another company down the line um, that I sold to a U.S. based software company. Um, at about when I was about 27, 28 years old. So I started at 18 by about 28. I was the head of marketing for a publicly traded software company in Silicon Valley, moved from my native uh, home of Montreal, Canada. And I did, um, three tours of duty as a CMO, um, uh, spent uh, a ton of time in Silicon Valley. I live close to Silicon Valley today in beautiful Santa Cruz. And, um, after my third CMO gig at a company called Mercury Interactive, we sold the company to Hewlett Packard in 2006 for $5 billion, uh, making HP my favorite company of all time. And, uh, and so I hung up my gloves as a CMO. I took a bunch of time off. I uh, started a boutique consultancy. And then ultimately that led to uh, my first book, which is called Play Bigger. Mm. And then my second book came out um, last year called Niche Down. And so today, uh, I'm a three-time CMO, entrepreneur. Uh, I'm mostly retired from that kind of stuff. I do some investing and advising. I've advised over 50 uh, Silicon Valley venture-backed technology companies in my career, and I do some of that. I, there's a, I'm working with a couple of big public companies on a, few, uh, on a little bit of strategy. But for the most part today, I'm uh, focused on uh, being an author, a podcaster, uh, surfing, uh, skiing, hiking, mountain biking, and chasing my um, wonderful, uh, wonderful wife around the house. <laughs> Thanks for the visual. <laughs> but 
But um, I thought I would stop there and leave the rest to your imagination. Yeah, I'm, I'm a creative guy, dude. Most creative people in business, fast company, just so you know. But uh, what an amazing story! I think uh, there's so much for us to dive into. So, um, where shall we begin? I think I think for some context, you know, this this show is is probably one of the most most popular shows, I guess, in the world of business and entrepreneurship in Africa. I, I thought it was the most popular entrepreneurship show on planet Earth. That's what it, it, I was. It might uh, be. It might be. I, I, somebody told me that. I think Matt Brown told me that. Oh, really? Don't believe everything you read on social media, buddy. <laughs> but um, but I guess I, you know my audience is really hungry for practical stuff and stuff that works. You know, as entrepreneurs, we're all very busy people. You know, we're under huge press. It's fucking lonely in many respects, and so you know. To have someone such as you on the show is just really exciting for me to kind of get into the meat and the potatoes and the nuts and bolts of like, you know, like, you know conceptually, what does niche down mean? And, you know, even on the other side of the pond there, um, you know, we don't get exposure. Like we, we're very isolated in terms of, you know, thinking in developed markets outside of books. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so that's just by a byproduct of where we are. And so um, – I'd love to start with the book. So why did you start writing the books? What was the, the kind of spark that led you to starting that particular writer's journey? So I have a dear friend. Her name is Peggy Burke, and she runs um, Beyond Question, the preeminent uh, branding and design agency in Silicon Valley called 1185 Design. And you kind of name a company and the likelihood that they designed their brand system uh, or in some way have worked with them. Um, you know, it, all the leaders in Silicon Valley walk through the doors of 1185. And that's because Peggy's a genius and she's created an incredible team. Anyway, her and I have worked together for, for uh, longer than, than I want to talk about. <laughs> and uh, years ago, Matt, she sort of sat me down and she said, hey, listen, you got to write a book. And I said, look, you know, I'm dyslexic. I'm, 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 you know, dyscalculia. Like uh, reading is tough for me, although I do lots of it. Uh, writing is even tougher. It's, it, it's taken me 15 years to suck as a writer. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, it just sounded like a lot of work. And then she said something that stuck with me, which is why I wanted to write Play Bigger, which is um, when I was 18, with no money, no relationships, no experience, no nothing. The only way I could learn how to be successful both in life and in business was to do, try stuff and fail. You know, you can't be a legend without being a loser. There's been a lot of losery around here and <laughs> I've lost more than I'll ever win. Um, so you, you learn by doing and trying and failing. You learn by reading and you learn by seeking out coaches and mentors. And so I did all of those things and I got very lucky in all of those areas and applied myself hard in all of those areas. And as a young man, Matt, there were a handful of books and we can talk about them if you like, um, that really made a gigantic difference. <clears throat> you know, so for example, uh, Ogilvy on advertising mm. and, um, and Peggy knew this about me. We're dear friends. And she said to me, look, where would you be in life if David Ogilvy had not written that book? And the answer is, you know, I'm not sure. I, you know, I don't know. But what I do know is um, there's a handful of authors who made a giant difference. And so she said to me, look, whether you realize it or not, you have one of those in you. And, you know, I don't know that I agree with her, but I did agree with her enough to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. And um, I collaborated with three other very smart guys. We were incredibly fortunate to get a top agent. And Harper Collins um, uh, to publish the book. So my publisher is Jack Welsh's publisher. Wow. Um, and and so you know when a top agent and a top publisher says, "Yeah, we want to do this," all of a sudden it re I realized like, okay, this shit is real. Mm -hmm. And and we went to work. And so that's a long answer, but really it came from a desire, Matt. When I realized that I had I was at a different stage of my life. And as somebody who's been successful, who started off delivering newspapers with nothing, um, I think if, if you're lucky enough to make it to the top of the mountain, then, um, you know, you, you, you should throw a line down and help some other people get up here, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, um, I think everyone has a book in them. You know, you just got to find the spark and the belief in yourself to write one. Because I, I think the disconnect there is that, you know, 
I don't know how your writing process was. And even with three writers, I don't know how bloody exponentially harder that must have been. But I mean, to, to write about your own story is not an easy thing for, for everyone to do. Some pe- for some people, it comes naturally, you know, but when you're writing <clears throat> about you and your, and, you know, trying to find your authentic voice and to put that in paper and to find the the concept that you can stand behind because a book is like a it truly is a part of a legacy that you're leaving behind right books tend to live for a very long time especially on amazon so yeah. <laughs> so um so i mean talk talk to us through your writing process um where how did you like land on a concept like play bigger and i know niche down was uh, kind of a follow-up to that but you know starting with play bigger for instance you know what what led you to writing about that specifically what were you hoping were some of the intended outcomes so um the primary topic in play bigger and frankly in niche down is the introduction of a new management discipline called category design And it's predicated on a simple um, but profound insight, which is most entrepreneurs, most inventors, most business leaders, most marketers, most scientists, most creators of any kind uh, fundamentally believe that you, at a high level, you need to do two things to be successful. One is create a legendary product. And two is create a legendary company to deliver that product. And in Silicon Valley, I've even heard, for example, uh, CEOs, founders say, I had one say this, this is an exact phrase to me. We make shit and we sell shit and everything else is bullshit. (laughs) And, and, and so there's this fundamental belief that, um, all we need to do is build a legendary product and the world will be the path to our door. Well, that's fundamentally fucking wrong. And here's my evidence for it. How many years after the invention of the wheel was the wheel used for transportation? (laughs) Hmm, I think it was terminated in around the Terminator movie, number two. Yeah, exactly. It was (laughs) was somewhere between Jurassic Park and Terminator. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it turns out, you know, I would argue that maybe with the exception of fire, um, the wheel's the greatest invention of all time, right? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. and it was 300 years after the invention of the wheel that somebody decided to use it for transportation. In the beginning, the wheel was used for pottery and it spun this way. Mm. And after 300 years, somebody drank, drank some Jack Daniels and said, hey, what if we tilt it on its side, added another one and attached it to a box? Maybe we could haul some shit. And so my point is, even the most legendary innovations, the most legendary creations do not speak for themselves. Mm. And so um, the legends design the way of thinking about a problem and a solution and teach the world via a provocative point of view how to think about things in the way they do. And once that happens, a whole new market category or niche emerges. Mm. And when that occurs, if you can execute, then you become the company that dominates that niche or category. Mm. And here's the aha. Virtually every, with few exceptions, marketing course in the history of marketing courses is bullshit. And the reason for that is there is an undeclared, undiscussed, untalked about, unthought about context whenever anybody talks about marketing. And that context is what we're doing is competing for share, market share in an existing category. So for example, you know, in the digital world, Everybody's all frothed up about growth hacking and SEO and, you know, funnels and all this shit, right? But that's all cool and, 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 and paid and earned and unearned and all this stuff that we're all trying to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing. What causes somebody to Google a word or a phrase? What comes before all of that? And so my point is, Marketing is all about capturing demand in an existing market category. That's one skill. There's a whole other skill called creating the demand. And that skill is where niche down comes in. That skill is what a category designer does. So a category designer, unlike a marketer, marketers play a better game predicated around an idea of comparison. I want you to see my product 
service, compare it to others. And when you see the merits of my product, we will win. That's the fundamental belief. And marketing is all about um, uh, taking existing demand and quote, funneling it to you. And when people see the merits of your product and compare it to your competitors, you're going to win. And here's what I would assert to you. Virtually none of the legends did that. That's not what Henry Ford did. That's not what Sarah Blakely, the inventor of Spanx, did. That's not what Steve Jobs did. That's not what any of those people did. They did not play a comparison game. Mm. They played a different game, not a better game. Mm. They wanted to be viewed as um, distinct. They They did not want to be compared to anything that came before. They wanted everything that came after them to be compared to them. Mm. When Jobs launches the iPhone, very few people compare it to the BlackBerry, right? But everybody compared the Samsung to the iPhone, Hmm. right? And so category designers create a demarcation point in thinking that moves the world from the way it is to the way they want it to be, establishing not a brand, but a new category. Hmm. And when that category tips, if the category designer can execute they become the company that gets two thirds of the economics and win. Mm. And so my point is legendary marketers, legendary entrepreneurs, and even legendary people in their own career, even if you're a local dentist or a carpenter or a website designer or whatever you are, you're, you're a solopreneur doing your own thing. Legends become known for a niche that they own. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't get taught in marketing school. Most people fall into the comparison trap. Most people fall into the brand trap. They don't understand categories make brands, not the other way around. All this stuff about personal branding, complete and utter bullshit. And what makes the brand is the category, not the other way around. Google has got one of the most powerful brands in the world. But the reason they do is because they're the category queen in the category of search. When they move out of their category and go into a head-to-head comparison, we're better than them competition against Facebook with Google+, they lose billions of dollars and have their ass handed to them because in spite of the power of their quote-unquote brand, their brand only matters in the context of their category. And even though we're sitting here in 2019, 99% of marketers and entrepreneurs don't get the distinction around marketing for share in an existing space, which is a fool's game, and creating your own space, being the designer of your own category so that you can niche down. And that's the big distinction. And what I love is, and it's why I'm, I'm so touched by what you said, when entrepreneurs get category design, when they get the power of pulling a niche down and they start thinking about niches and categories, they see the world completely differently. Yeah. It's a new lens on business. And once it's a new skill, and once you have that skill, you know, you got dig, it's a digital kung fu behind you, right? You're, you're, you have a ninja skill that no one else has. And people are like, there's this old uh, um, uh, um, far side cartoon, Matt. Yep. You guys get the far side over there? Do we get the far side cartoons? We do. Yeah, we do. I haven't yeah. seen it. Uh, Gary Trudeau. Uh, And there's these two guys standing in front of a horse-drawn carriage and there's flaming arrows landing around them. And one guy's looking at the other guy and says, hey, they're lighting the arrows on fire. Are they allowed to do that? (laughs) And category design is like that. When you literally change the rules of the game in a market Mm. so that you rewrite what the definition of an entire problem set and therefore solution set is going to be, and the competitors go, what the fuck? Nobody's coming over here anymore. They're all going over there. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. That's the power of category design. Okay. So there's so much I want to say here. So the first one is about the wheel thing. Um, do you know when the human race, despite all of our ingenuity and innovation and stuff, do you know what year, if you were to hazard a guess, that we put wheels on bags you know like heavy luggage at the airports you know now you run through the airports and it kind of wheels your your luggage along or along rather what year do you think we started that or when did we put wheels on bags it's recent um i would (laughs) i don't know for sure but it's certainly within the last 30 years 1972 you know what's funny about that you know what's funny about that is that we put a man on the moon before we put wheels on bags 
How's that for, for you? For uh, my guess is the yeah. wheels on bags is slightly easier as an innovation, but I'm just guessing. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe the bag companies will tell us. Yeah, I, who knows? But I mean, I, when I first heard that, and I've used it in a couple of keynotes of mine, it's 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 important to land that you, even when you're thinking about category design because it's the question that matters. And uh, yes. yeah, like totally. And then you know, just in our own business, like we like we've got this lightning strike. We talk about point of view. We talk about category design, and uh, our category in the sort of technology sector, marketing for martech sector, is storytelling technology. We've created that category. Which is interesting, right? It's as an idea, it's fucking like it's just exciting. No, every time we sit in front of like a Microsoft or a big ass company or a CMO and we mention the words storytelling technology together, they go, Oh, what's that? You know, and it creates a point of difference. And then, of course, you know, our product's bulletproof and we've got a great team here. Um, but it, I can tell you, it's just, I just really want to get this point across. Like, if people are looking to like create a step change in their business legitimately and do it fast and quickly and, and, and you know, in pretty much far less time than you could ever do on your own, like this whole idea around marrying category design and a point of view and doing things at scale quickly, hard, fast, and in an aggressive fashion is pretty much what we've built our entire brand on, you know, and um, it's, it's just really, really exciting. I'm so stoked to hear that. And you have no idea, you know, for better or for worse, I poured 30 years into those 270 pages uh, of play bigger and um candidly matt you know i had no idea whether or not it was going to land hmm. no idea because my batting average prior to writing the book working one-on-one -on -one with companies was probably two and ten two hundred percent you know uh, 200 batting average two and ten got it and were able to execute it but eight out of ten times the gravitational pull of the existing market, the fundamental belief, like the belief in the availability of oxygen that the best product wins, the fundamental belief that all we need to do is demo our product and, and all we need to have is like good, this is a word I fucking hate, messaging. We just need some good messaging, right? Um, and, and messaging is this thing people change like they change their underwear, which is why I fucking hate it. It's, it's bullshit, right? Uh, it's okay for a campaign, but it's not strategic, right? There's a huge distinction between messaging and what you could think of as a point of view. A point of view is true fucking north. It's something you stay with, right? Mark Benioff owns an island in Hawaii because for the better part of 20 years, he has stayed on his point of view, no software, right? Mm. Um, uh, Henry Ford had a point of view about the horseless carriage, Right. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Sarah Blakely had a point of view that was um, not about girdles, but about what she called shapewear, about making women look more shapely. Right. And it was different. And she stayed on it. And she's the um, the most successful self-made billionaire in American history. And so uh, my point is for me to sit here today. Uh, we're almost at the three year anniversary of Play Bigger coming out. And to think you, Matt Brown, in beautiful South Africa with all of your friends and colleagues uh, are reading my shit and it's making a difference for you. Mm. Fucking A, dude. You made my week, yeah. if not my month. <laughs> well, thanks for that, man. Look, I mean, the other thing to say is that, um, you know, it's uh, theories basically fucking worthless. <laughs> You've actually got to apply the thing. Um, and you know, t we, we use words like messaging in, uh, in our kind of Bible at the moment, you know what I mean? Cause we have to, because the market, it, it knows what that means. It's like, well, you're going to have to review the messaging. It's like, okay, I get it. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, but I will say that, you know, I'm seeing more and more of this, like we're going to, uh, London in 10 days time to, for the London tech week. So we won the best, uh, tech startup in Africa award. So we um, we're being flown over hold, hold, there. Hold on, hold on, yeah. there, Hanson. You you won the what? The the best tech startup in Africa award. Fuck yeah, Matt Brown. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking yeah. I hey, hate I hate who awards. Are you? I'll tell you who I am. I'm the fucking guy that won the best fucking startup award in all of Africa. That's who the fuck I am. <laughs> we, we need to talk more about that shit, actually. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. 
I yeah. think you need to rent helicopters and drop flyers over the entire <laughs> continent. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious, man. But, um, you know, but to be fair, like you hate the word messaging. I hate awards because I come from like the advertising kind of background. And, uh, you know, I just don't believe that agencies can service the tech sector at all. They just fail largely. Um, and so well, and yeah. they fail because they don't understand their job. The yeah, job they- of an agency, the job of a marketer mm. is to design and dominate a giant category such that we take two thirds of the economics and are worth a shit ton of money, right? So fundamentally, all marketing is about materially increasing the value of a company by designing and dominating a giant category that matters. Mm -hmm. And the problem with most agencies is they think their their job is messaging. They think their job is campaigns. They think their job is pretty fucking pictures, and they have long, stupid arguments over which color of blue should we use in the fucking (laughs) logo, right? Now, listen... (laughs) I'm a three-time public company CMO. I think the color of the logo is an important discussion, but it's an important discussion in the context of will this logo help us design and dominate a category that matters? You know, what happens is marketers play with shiny toys and designers are like frustrated artists who wish they could be like you know, I don't know who Picasso or Pollock or whoever their favorite artist is. And they realized they couldn't make any fucking money doing that. So they decided they would design logos or campaigns or websites or whatever. And so they take their frustrated art and they do art and business. Well, art in business doesn't make the cash register ring. Art and business doesn't create unfair competitive advantage. Branding and design is critical but it's only effective when it sits in the context of, is it supporting, is it empowering our ability to design and dominate a giant category and beat the living shit out of anybody who would be ever compared to us? Mm. Then in that context, let's talk about which color or blue we should use. Mm. But instead, marketers get caught up in all this inane bullshit as opposed to making sure they're on track with what matters, which is designing and dominating a giant category, Mm -hmm. materially increasing the value of the company and becoming the best tech startup in all of fucking Africa. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Preach, brother. I'm making you an honorary board member for sure. You're like country chairman of America. Yeah, I I love it. I'm I'm in. (laughs) I mean, I want to talk to you about story because I haven't had a chance to do so. I mean, what we've done in our business is we've connected the storytelling intellectual property to the idea of a point of view. So what we do is we take storytelling as it relates to this point of view and category design, and then we basically produce a fuck ton of content and create loads of media coverage as part of a land grab. So for instance, if we, we've got a client um, down here that's in the cloud business, but we won't market them as a cloud business. Do you know what I mean? Because everyone's trying to, you know, the Microsoft just launched these data centers here in Africa for the first time. It's going to create like 100,000 jobs. It's quite a big stink for an international company to do something like that locally. It's, it's a huge sort of, you know, um, demonstration of faith in the local community here. And, you know, naturally, of course, you know, cloud being like the Bitcoin boom market as it was in January, 2015. Um, and so it's very hyper competitive. It's very liquid. There's loads of, comp- of, of competitors, there's 16,000 resellers, there's distributors, and that's just in South Africa. So more broadly across Africa, it's a different game. So if you're trying to take the idea of cloud to market, you can't say that you sell cloud. You have to say that you sell something else. So what, what, what we do as part of something called a story sprint, we, um, we identify a thread that we feel that we can own. And, and in this particular instance, this client basically told us that, you know, when uh, when a business moves to the cloud for the first time, they typically move to Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services. And what they don't realize is that, or what they think they're signing up for is cheap infrastructure. But the irony is, and what you don't get told in any marketing spiel or story is that your costs don't stay the same. They go up. And over time, your cost structure actually increases. So cloud is the gift that keeps on giving if you're selling it. If you're using it, it's a cost structure that you have to watch. <laughs> so so what, what we're positioning in terms of a point of view is the alternative cloud. It's still cloud, 
right? Because they integrate into AWS and Azure. But the idea being, you know, in terms of a category that they can own, it's this idea of the alternative cloud. It's like when you get fucked by the price point that you don't dig, or when you've got a solution architecture that doesn't actually fit your, your growing business demand. In other words, you can't scale, or whatever the case is, or maybe it's a data sovereignty issue, that the idea is there's an alternative option. And that's the category that we're trying to get them to own. What do you think about the power of story as it relates to a point of view, as I've described it? So the truth is, the concept of a POV is a story. A POV is just a very particular kind of story. So uh, I believe as strongly as I know you do in the power of story, Mm. um, stories are the only thing that matter. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the CEO yesterday of a $20 billion publicly traded tech company. We're talking about exactly this, Matt. Mm. And stories will cause people to join armies and give their life in a cause. That's the power of a story. A story will cause hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to join a war and give their life in service of a story. You know, you think about South Africa as a country. It's a story. Mm. There's no fucking country South Africa. There's no there's no line at a border. That's all made that's that's a made up story, right? It's all made up. And we subscribe to our tribe. We subscribe to the story of our family, the story of our ethnicity, the story of our religion, the story of our country, uh, et cetera. And we feel pride. You know, I love that, like right now, I'll give you a simple example. Right now, tonight, in California, the Golden State Warriors are going to begin playing the Toronto Raptors in the NBA Finals. Mm-hmm. And there are millions of people in California and millions of people in Canada cheering these teams on and they will celebrate victories and, 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 and suffer losses as though something actually fucking happened to them. When people talk about sports teams, they say, oh, we played really great last night. Well, you didn't play shit. You sat on your couch and drank beer, right? Right. And so we have this story that we belong to this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this, you know, myths, the power of myths. Go, go, go to Joseph Campbell, Mm. right? The hero's journey, right? And so uh, my wife and I were talking about this morning, this, this morning, Matt, what is our, what are our memories? Our memories real? Our memories are just the story of what happened to us in a particular time and circumstance in our lives. And so what's my point? Much of life comes down to story. Mm. And here's the thing people don't get from a marketing perspective. The legendary innovators, scientists, entrepreneurs, designers, musicians, artists, every legendary person that you and I admire, we admire because they did something different. They broke and took new ground. There was a before them and an after them. And the way they made that happen was not through their product, but their story about their product. Mm -hmm. When people first saw Picasso's work, they said, that looks like the work of a drunken, mentally handicapped (laughs) eight-year-old. And he said, no, that's where you're wrong. It's a new type of art called cubism, you dumbass. And once you believe, <laughs> once you believe that cubism is a new, important, I'm going to use this word on purpose, different type of art, then you believe Picasso is a genius. And I would assert to you, Matt, the reason we know who Picasso is, is because he is viewed as the category designer of cubism. If you look up his profile on Wikipedia in the first or second page, it says something along those lines. He's the creator of cubism. And so cubism is a new category of art. And the only reason we know the, the Picasso brand is because the cate- he convinced the world through a story about art that this was a new category, a new type of art. Mm-hmm. And so my point is... Without the cubism story, what you could think of as the cubism point of view, it's the work of a mentally handicapped, drunken eight-year-old. 
with the story, people pay $20 million to get their hands on one of these fucking things. <laughs> I love that example. I, I just want to talk to you about the, the relationship between story and identity because identity for me is is probably one of the most powerful forces in, in, in the world if, and in the same case in terms of marketing and the ability for story to, to, to effectively activate a particular persona or identity is, is an art and a skill that anyone can learn, but many of us don't quite get right. Um, just in your experience, you know, coming back from, you know, three times CMO and then obviously consulting and stuff like that. And just, you know, with the groundswell of sort of, you know, businesses and, and decision makers that listen to your podcast and stuff like that. Um, and even actually, by the way, follow your different, right, as an idea. It's follow your different. So your different implies that there's an identity dynamic and that underpins that, right? Would you agree with that? And what is the what is the kind of role in in of identity in securing a, a point of view and ultimately a category that you can own? Uh, I love this conversation. <laughs> uh, I think all an identity is is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. So our, your identity, my identity, is the story I tell about myself. So you ask me off the top, give, give us some background. I tell you my story. There's a million ways I could tell my story all that would all be factually true. There's a whole bunch of things I left off. There's a bunch of things I emphasized, right? And the reason I left the things off that I left off and the reason that I emphasized the thing that I emphasized is my identity is who I am is a guy who started off with nothing at 18 years old. Who I am is a guy with dysphoria. Who I am is a marketer. Who I am is an uncle. Who I am is a very enthusiastic, mediocre surfer. Uh, who I am is now an author. Who I am is now a podcaster. Who I am is the, quote, father of eight fucking chickens, right? Uh, <laughs> who I am is a martial artist. Who I am is a guy with his racing license who probably will kill everybody on the track. Um, so the identity that we have is really the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm. And the interesting part about this, and this is why category design matters so much, both at the company level and frankly, at the personal level, is some of the story that we tell ourselves are things that we designed. That is to say, listen, for whatever I am as a, as a mediocre surfer, I fucking made myself that surfer. For what I am as an entrepreneur, I made myself that. Nobody fucking gave me that. What I am as a marketer, I fucking, I, I, I worked my balls off to learn that, to do the things that I did, to create billions of dollars worth of market cap on legendary teams that I've been associated with. I designed, I said, that's who I want to be, and I made myself that. Those things are intentional. And I think the concept of designing a legendary business and a legendary life, that is to say, I'm the one with the pen. Most people, when they talk about markets, they talk about them like the weather. This is why product market fit is one of the dumbest, most dangerous ideas in the history of business. Because when you say product market fit, what you're declaring is that there's this thing out there called a market and I need to fit my product into that market. Well, that's bullshit. There isn't a thing called a market. We talk about the market like it's the weather. It's not the fucking weather. When we listen to the weather report today, the weather gal or guy gets up and says today in Santa Cruz, the forecast is it's going to be 68 degrees and partly cloudy. Those are facts, right? Markets are not facts. We design them. There's a reason a high-end pair of sunglasses costs 300 bucks and a, and a flat screen television costs 150 bucks. Somebody made it that way. Okay. And so what's my point? My point is this at a business level and at a personal level, there are areas where we are very intentional about designing ourselves and our business exactly the way we want them. And most people, Matt, they accept somebody else's design. So they say, oh, fuck. Oh, you're in the, you know, you're in the blah, blah business. Oh, that's a tough business, man. Oh, yeah, that's a tough business. 
or when we're, when we're eight years old in school and somebody says to us, you know, you're not very, the teacher says, you're not very athletic. And, the, and we go, oh yeah, that's right. We're not very athletic. And now we have a story that says, oh, I'm in a tough market or, oh, I'm not very athletic. We subconsciously surrender to somebody else's story and accept it as the truth. This is the mistake marketers make. And this is frankly the mistake many of us make in our lives. And the breakthrough aha is that we're the designer, both of our lives and of our business. And you cannot just design a legendary product. You can be the person that designs how the category works. Somebody decided high-end sunglasses are 300 bucks and uh, a fucking flat screen TVs that talk to satellites in space are 150 bucks. Somebody decided that. Markets are a function of the way we behave. We are not the function of markets behave. And 99% of people get that wrong. And most people accept the identity stories that are told to us by other people. One teacher, when we were six years old, who said to us, hey, we're not very athletic. We wear that like the truth, as opposed to designing our own truth. Mm. There's a, that's such a powerful concept, eh? it really is. Where does it go wrong, though, um, in the sense that, you know, product market fit, especially in our sector, like the tech sector, is like, no, you got to get an MVP, minimum viable product. And in fact, I was using these terms just this week. So thanks for reminding me that I'm completely fucking wrong. But um, <laughs> MVP is complete fucking bullshit, too. Uh -huh. What is it? Why? I'll tell then? you why MVP go, is bullshit. Go. MVP suggests that you should look, just get it out to market. Just get out any piece of shit with the minimum amount of crap and see how it works. Really? That's our idea of building legendary products. That's fucking mental. That's absolutely <laughs> mental. You know, this whole bullshit about, well, when you look back, you, you, you should be ashamed of version one of your product. Really? Are you fucking insane? Are you, are you ashamed of episode one of the Matt Brown show? Yes. Yes, I am. Well, but you weren't <laughs> at the fucking time. <laughs> and that's my point. If yeah. you don't think it's legendary, nobody fucking else will. And so this whole idea of minimum viable product is complete bullshit. You should think version one of your podcast, of your software, of your fucking pizza from your new pizza store, or whatever the hell it is you're doing in life, you should think it's awesome. If you don't think it's legendary... <laughs> Who the fuck will? Do you know the number one question, Matt, I asked people as a CMO when, when my marketing team would come to me with any kind of execution, any kind of plan, any kind of program, any kind of anything. Before I looked at it, I would say to them, do you think this is legendary? Hmm. We were in a meeting when we sold HP, uh, we, when we sold Mercury to HP, the chief marketing officer of HP's enterprise business, Deb Nelson invited me to a meeting and they had, and I won't say the name of the agency because it's not nice. They had one of the biggest ding dong advertising agencies in the history of American advertising agencies. If I told you some of their campaigns, you'd know exactly who these people are. This is HP. At the time, they were the largest tech company in the world. And at the time, the Mercury acquisition was the largest software acquisition they'd ever done and the largest acquisition they'd done uh, since they had acquired a compact. It was a very big deal. It was the largest acquisition that Mark Hurd, who was the CEO at the time, had ever done in his career at any company. This was a big fucking damn deal. So HP decides they're going to run uh, some ads in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times promoting this. And I'm, I'm exiting as CMO of Mercury, and, but I'm working on the transition team. So anyways, we sit down, we go into this meeting, and this super ding-dong a uh, super successful advertising agency is going to present the creative for the full page ads in the Wall Street Journal uh, announcing and celebrating the acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. And like most big companies, they can't have a meeting with three people. There's 437 people in the fucking meeting, right? You've been to this meeting where it takes like half an hour for everybody to introduce each other. Anyways, so we go around, we do the whole fucking thing, right? And we're getting ready to begin. And Deb Nelson, the head of marketing for HP, turns to me and says, Christopher, before we begin, is there anything you'd like to say? And I said, yes. <laughs> I said to the head of the team from the super ding dong ad agency, we'll just call him Jimmy. I said, hey, Jimmy, <laughs> do you think 
what you're about to present to us is legendary work. And he said, what do you mean? I said, what do I mean? Here's what I mean. I'll tell you exactly who I mean, what I mean. I said, number one, you guys are, and then I said the name of the firm, Super Ding Dong Advertising Agency, and I listed for them some of the legendary campaigns that they have done, which were truly legendary. I said, that's who you guys are, right? He goes, yeah, that's who we are. I said, well, who HP is, is, and this was the case at the time, the largest technology company in the world. And then I repeated all that shit I said to you earlier about how important this acquisition was. And they were going to spend giant amount of money, right? And I said, so given that you guys are this super ding dong ad agency, and given that this is Hewlett fucking Packard, the biggest technology company in the world doing the biggest software acquisition they've ever fucking done, I say, collectively, if we're going to do some advertising, we should do legendary work. And so given that, what I want to know before you present your creative to us for this ad is, do you, Jimmy, and your team at Super Ding Dong Advertising Agency think that what you're about to present us is legendary? You know what he said? No. Can we have 48 hours? <laughs> wow. And what I didn't say to him, and you know, Deb gave him the extra time. What I didn't say to him is, this is what I said to her afterwards and her team is, so you mean to tell me that you fuckers were going to come in here and present us with creative that you didn't think was legendary. You got, that makes you an asshole. That's what that makes you. <laughs> and so to get back to MVP, if you put out a product or a service that you think is the quote minimum viable product, that makes you an asshole. <laughs> You should put out a product that you say is fucking legendary. Mm -hmm. Preach. Now, look, I'm like you. I can't listen to the early episodes of my podcast. <laughs> I can't because we evolve and we grow. That doesn't uh -huh. mean that at the time I wasn't proud of them. Of course mm -hmm. I was. And I'm still proud of them. I just think I've learned a lot of shit in two years. Right. Mm -hmm. My writing today is better then when Play Bigger came out, Play Bigger is coming up on its third anniversary. My second book, Niche Down, I believe is, is better written than my first book. And I hope I feel that way. As a matter of fact, if I don't feel that way about my third book, I won't fucking put it out. Mm. Because you and I, when we do work, we have to believe it's legendary. And so this whole bullshit about telling entrepreneurs to do the minimum viable thing, you're out of your mind. Do something you believe is legendary. Mm. That's so rad. Tell me something. I, I, this conversation comes up a lot. In fact, I've got um, um, Adam Byers from Grid. Um, they're a like, South African Joburg-born agency gone on to the global stage, you know, because they've acquired by TBWA a while back. And um, like they're working for Qatar, you know, and they're doing just incredible things in the sort of traditional agency design. They call it investment creative. Um, and um, what do you think is the future of the ad agency? What's your view on that? So I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the ad agency world. Um, and I love what a lot of folks are doing. And here's why. Number one, um, we've never had more data. And we are going through a profound uh, data transformation that I think most people are not in tune with. And here's the profound transformation. For the most part, for the 50-ish year history of information technology, data has been a record of what happened. And we use that information for reporting on the past so that we can inform our actions in the present to affect our results in the future, that's what information technology, for the most part, at a very high level and a very simplistic level, has been a record of what happened so that we can report and analyze the past so that we can affect the future that we want. That's what the fuck IT, digital technology, has been about. We are fast moving into a world, and we see many companies doing it already, where data is not just a record of what happened. Data is what makes things happen in real time. And then, of course, the next evolution of that, which we are also beginning to experience, 
is a predictive quality. So based on what happened, based on making things happen in the present, we are getting better and better at predicting what might likely happen in the future. And so as we move from a record of what happened to making things happen, to being predictive about what we want to have happen, from a pure marketing point of view, it's, it's magic because we now have data about what works and doesn't work. We didn't used to have that before. Uh, we're about to drop an episode of my podcast with the legendary uh, Rick Bennett. Rick Bennett, um, his personal tagline, he's a one-man ad agency in Utah. His, he, he, and he was the original ad guy for Larry Ellison, and he was the original ad guy for Mark Benioff and many others. He's, he's, he's a, uh, a secret weapon in the technology industry. Mm. He was the guy, by way of example, um, uh, one of Oracle's early competitors was a company called ASK. I forget what the ASK stood for, but of course they shortened it to ask and they had a database. He's the guy that wrote the ad with the body with the headline copy that said Oracle kicks ask and takes names. <laughs> He's the guy that wrote the headline for uh, Mark Benioff that said, stop giving Tom Siebel your lunch money. <laughs> anyway, his personal tagline is, Rick Bennett, because God hates cowards. And he, he <laughs> says that I do marketing that will attack your competition like a pack of speed crazed Wolverines. And so on one hand, you know, this is a guy who embraces the data. Mm. And I think that's very important. And our ability to test things uh, is, is like never before. And so the analytical part of marketing, the data part of marketing, and the technology part of marketing where we can use data not just to report, but to trigger things in real time. Yeah. All that is incredibly exciting and powerful. And the fact that we have data scientists working in marketing today is extraordinarily awesome. Mm -hmm. Point A. Point B on the agents. So I think you need to be you need to be a sensei at that if you're an agency. Point B, here's the fun thing. The marketing world is in the process of over-rotating onto data and anal analyzing things. What do you mean by that? It's, well, uh, we're in the process of believing that <laughs> analytics will set us for free. Yeah. And, um, and look, I, everything I just said is meant to be incredibly laudatory about the use of data and analytics and about getting us more and more effective. I think that is incredibly exciting. Hmm. However, we're over-rotating there because you cannot discount the power of intuition. You cannot research a big idea. You can't even fucking test a big idea. You can't because, listen, I'll give you a simple example. When TiVo came out with the DVR, mm -hmm. if you had done a survey and asked people, hey, do you want a DVR? eight out of 10 people would have said no. Because what, what, when you're truly introducing something new, the world isn't educated about it. And most of us don't want something new. I don't, I don't, I, I didn't buy one. I thought, oh, that's cool, but fuck it. I don't need that. We don't need more bullshit in our lives. I don't want that thing, right? Mm. And of course, today, most of us are incapable of watching a commercial. And most of us think it's absolutely asinine that you would wait till eight o'clock on Thursday night to watch your favorite fucking show. We want to watch whatever we want to watch whenever we want to watch it. And if we want to watch it on our phone or our computer or our iPad or our TV, or if we want to start on our TV and then go to our iPad and that, that's what we want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So that all seems asinine today, mm -hmm. but 15 years ago, the only paradigm we knew was the paradigm of, well, if the show's on at eight o'clock on Thursday, you better fucking make an appointment with yourself to sit down and watch your show. <laughs> My point is you can't research a big idea. And if you ask, look, if, if Henry Ford does a fucking survey monkey and asks people, hey, do you want a horseless carriage? 10 out of 10 people say no. Mm. If, if, if Evian surveys people and says, hey, instead of getting it for free out of the tap, how about paying 20 bucks for it in a bottle? Everybody says no. And in, by the way, from a product perspective, in a blind taste test, everybody says it's water. 
And yet those fucking people have convinced us to pay much money for bottled water. Think about that. It comes out of the tap for free and we pay for it. <laughs> right. They, they taught the world to pay for water. It's crazy. Anyways, I digress. My point is on one hand, <laughs> On one hand, data and analytics are incredibly powerful and they open up a whole new way to be effective. However, as the geeks take over marketing, they over rotate on data. And what that means is those of us with strategic minds, those of us with creative minds, and those of us who are more intuitive, who think, and I'm going to use this word very much on purpose, Matt, differently. The value of creativity, the value of different, the, the value of innovation, and the value of intuition increases as the marketing world over rotates on the value of analytics and data. Because analytics and data live in a paradigm called the way it is and the way the world responds today. Mm. Creativity, innovation, strategery lives in, the, in, in, in a domain called the way it could be. And in the beginning, when Airbnb shows up on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, every VC says, go fuck yourself. This is the dumbest idea ever. What do you mean rent a fucking blow up couch in your house? There's a million reasons why that is the dumbest idea of all time. And then the guys at Sequoia invest. And here's why they invest. They imagine a different world. And you have to suspend your knowledge of the current world to imagine the possible in the world that a dreamer sees. And if that dreamer is able to educate the world about their vision, their point of view via a story, then all of a sudden Airbnb happens. But when you first look at it 10, 12 years ago, you go, this is fucking mental. But then when you imagine a different world, you can see it. And the way people see that, Matt, is through the effective, powerful delivery of a story about what could be true. Mm -hmm. And Jim Getz, the number one venture capitalist in the world, according to Forbes, says if the category exists, he's, he's at Sequoia, the company that invested in Airbnb, if the category exists, we don't want to invest. Hmm. It's powerful stuff, man. And so that's why I think it's a legendary time mm. because we have the marriage of awesome analytics and data and agencies who don't uh, fall down that rabbit hole, but use it effectively in concert with strategy, in concert with uh, innovative, creative, in concert with being willing, having the courage to see the possible. You know, what, what, what we lovingly refer to around here as pirates, dreamers, and innovators right? You have to, my friend, Bill Walton, the legendary NBA player says, you have to have the dream, right? He said, I always wanted to be, he's one of the 50 greatest players in the history of the NBA. According to the NBA, you have to have the dream first. And entrepreneurs are the people who have the courage to dream that our world could be different. And then they use story, what we call a point of view to move the world from the way it is to the way it could be. And that's what Airbnb did. That's what Henry Ford did. That's what Sarah Blakely did. That's what every legendary entrepreneur ever did. That's what Picasso did. That's what Bob Marley did, right? Bob Marley is the category designer of a new genre of music called reggae. You and I know who he is. We don't know who the 47th greatest reggae band in the world is. We have no fucking clue, right? And so that's what the legends do. And that's why most marketing training is bullshit. Because most marketing training says we accept the way it is and now we compete with a we're better than them strategy. That's not what legends did. Legends say, I'm doing something different. I'm doing something unique. I, I want to do something that's exponentially different, not incrementally better. And in order to do that, I'm going to tell the world a powerful story about the way I see things. And in particular, a problem and a solution. And when the world agrees with you about your perspective, your point of view mm. on that problem and solution, bam, you get the automobile, you get Airbnb, you get Spanx, you get Picasso, you get Bob Marley, you get the Ramones with punk rock, et cetera. Mm. 
Chris, that's such rad stuff. I mean, just to go back on the data and um, and the link between kind of creativity and technology, I mean, that's pretty much a big part of the reason why we we came up with our own category points of view of storytelling technology, because, you know, you have to be tech enabled in some way, shape or form. You know, it's like take the next 10,000 startups and just add AI, you know? Um, and so when you've got, and by the way, you know, as you know, as you very well know, um, you know, all these tools are becoming cheaper and cheaper, more and more powerful. So the access to technology is going to become the leveler. At some point, everyone will have access to the same tools, right? The ability to scale quickly. And so the difference, I suppose, in our world really comes down to creativity because creativity and in in to your point, like your intuition, you know, that is for us, and at least anyway, from what the, our clients are kind of saying is that, you know, the ability to tell that story in a way that makes something super fucking complicated like Azure or AWS or whatever the case is, especially to the, the ill-informed or the uninformed, you know, the ability to convey a story that makes something really complicated, memorable, relatable, and understandable. And in a way that resonates and says, you know what, this is a new point of view on an old problem. Right. And then marketing the hell out of that point of view so that you're accredited as the best partner or solution to that problem, even though other people can solve it. You know, and, yes, the, amen, hallelujah. Yeah. And <laughs> the, the other sort of uh, uh, thing I would tease out with you, Matt, is the human brain works in a fascinating way, mm. which is um, we believe that the first person and or company that articulates and educates us about the problem. A, must have the solution, and B, is the leader in that niche. <laughs> the one-eyed man, what? Sorry, Chris is trying, another Chris here is trying to say something. The land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tom Waits has sung a couple of songs about that, if I remember correctly. <laughs> 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 yes, he has. So let's talk about Follow Your Different. What are you trying to get across? Because I know you're, you've rebranded your podcast. I think you're like 30, 40 episodes in now, at least from last time I checked, potentially there's more than that. What are you trying to, to get across uh, you know, in terms of this idea of Follow Your Different? So here's the crazy aha. And it's, I think it's, it's one of the greatest dichotomies in life. The first point would be, we live in a world where most of us are taught to fit in. Most of us are taught to color inside the lines. Most of us are taught to compete. Most of us are taught to accept the way that it is and to try to do um, better with it. The aha is every legendary person you and I respect and admire didn't do that. They are somebody who broke and took new ground. They are somebody who fundamentally did something exponential that was different as opposed to incremental that was better. That's point A. Here's the other one on a, you want to get uh, sort of a little deep on human beings. What you and I want the most, Matt, in our relationships with others is we want to be loved for what makes us uniquely us. Hmm. And so what connects people is the acceptance of what makes us different. Because when we are accepted for the things that make us unique, we feel like we are accepted and loved for who we truly are. And so the most successful human beings in the world make their own place in the world and they build relationships with people who love and accept them for their differences and that's what makes us the same so it's what it's 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 being loved for our differences that is the thing that makes us similar because you want to be respected and admired for the things that you think make you unique as an entrepreneur you know as a son as a, a, a you know all the roles that you have in your life right mm. and so what follow your different is about is the most legendary people and the most legendary companies are the ones that have the courage to be different and connect that different to the world in a way that creates value. And when we do that, we build legendary companies. And as individuals, when we do that, that's the foundation of all of our relationships. 
my wife loves me because I'm not all the other guys she met. That's why I love her. I love the things that make her uniquely her, right? Mm. And so it's the people who are different that make the biggest difference. It's the companies who have the courage to stand out, to break from the pack, to take and break new ground that we respect and admire. We love Craig Ventner because he's the scientist who mapped the human genome. And a lot of scientists said that wasn't even possible. And it cost tens of millions of dollars in 1998. And today, your sister-in-law gives you a little fucking box for Christmas for 35 bucks from 23andMe, and they'll map your genome for you. It's crazy. And so my point is, it's the people who are different that make the difference. Mm. And so it's only by celebrating our different and connecting our different to the world at the company level, at the product level, and at the personal level that we find success. Mm. And most importantly, that we design a life that works for us. Mm. That's such a cool notion um, to bring it back to that same principle into the world of podcasting. I, I get asked a lot like, hey man, you know, Matt, tell me what kind of podcast should I start? And you know, what's, what's my name of a podcast? Like I, one guy said, like, I want your exposure one day and this kind of stuff, you know. Um, and uh, I said to the guy, one of them said to me, you know, uh, there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of podcasts out there. Um, why should I start a podcast when it's there's so many options, so much content, so many people, so many experts, authors, et cetera, et cetera. How am I ever going to be relevant at all in such a hyper-competitive space? And I said to him, dude, the thing about podcasting is that there might be many of them, but no one will do a podcast like you. It's impossible. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> That's going to be the, the hashtag for this episode. <laughs> well, yeah. And here's the biggest problem. And it's, it's, it's an acute problem particularly in podcasts that are business oriented or that are personal development, um, you know, life development oriented. The vast majority of them are not original. Mm. The vast majority of them are ripoffs of something else. The vast majority of business podcast hosts and, and personal development hosts, hosts, they're fucking cartoon characters. They're idiots. They're the Grant Cardones and the Gary V's of the world, right? They're characters, right? Or they're, or even worse, they're knockoffs of Tony Robbins, right? They're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're regurgitations of crapola. I'm sure you've been on it. I've had this happen to me as a podcast guest. You know, there's that moment before we go live, like we had today, you and I get chitty chatty. We warm ourselves up and then we go live, right? Uh -huh. And I don't know if you've had this happen. You'll tell me. But I've had that warm up chitty chat with a, with a podcaster. They hit record, and then all of a sudden they go, "Hi, <laughs> welcome to the <laughs> bullshit," <laughs> and <laughs> and they turn into this fucking absolute cartoon character, crazy, whatever. And it's like, dude, who are you, man? What what are you doing? And and they, they it's like, oh, that's my personal brand. I have my podcast persona. That's all bullshit. <laughs> That's all contrived. Personal branding is one of the one of the plagues on the earth, right? <laughs> I agree with you. There's one thing for sure that's going to be different about your podcast. That's your fucking doing it. And don't <laughs> if you're going to start a podcast, don't rip yourself off by trying to be some kind of a fucking re-swizzle of an idiot like Gary V. Be yourself. <laughs> Oh, I can see lots of people like basically falling off their chairs at the back there, especially Quincy. Yeah, look at him down the back there. Put your hands up. <laughs> How you so, doing, Quincy? So, Did you fall off your table or your chair on that one? <laughs> You're fine now. Are you a Gary V fan? Yeah, you must be, right? Because he's like all about the youth and shit. Right. Am so, I a Gary V fan? No, not you. I'm talking to Quincy. No, <laughs> fuck. We know you not. We certainly know you not. <laughs> but I mean, it's called struggle porn, right? Is that, have you heard about that? Someone said to me on the podcast the other day, they were like, yeah, yeah, this fucking, it was Mike Stockport. He runs a, well, he exited a really big. Um, yeah. Big, listen, uh, we, uh, with all due modesty, <laughs> I'm on the front end of declaring bullshit on struggle porn. 
Uh, we did a podcast episode uh, recently called Fuck Hustle, The Seven Reasons You Should Fuck Hustle. Gary Vee says hustle is the most important word in the English language. Grant Cardone said on CNBC, this idiot said nobody ever died of working too hard. Really? In Japan, they have a fucking word for it because so many people die from overwork, you idiot. And what these people don't understand is the reason we want to build a legendary business is so we design a legendary life. Our business is about our life. And we, these idiots have gotten it backwards. They think your life is about your business. No, your business is about who you are in your life. And on top of that, anybody who works 150 hours a week can't work properly. If you don't get seven, eight hours of sleep a night, you can't fucking think. If you never stop working, you never get to have sex with your wife. You never get to relax and have a beer. You never get to go work out. You never get to have a surf or a hike or a ski or a bike ride or whatever thing you like to go do. You never get to spend time with your family. You never get to go for a nice fucking walk and you never get to go on a nice vacation and see a sunset at a beach or go climb a mountain or whatever the thing you like to do is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And look, I'm not saying there aren't times in one's life where you need to work 120 hours a week. Absolutely. And in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm a reformed uh, smoker, a reformed alcoholic on this stuff because I spent 20 years working 80 to 120 hours a week, traveling two to 400,000 miles a year on a plane. And what I'm here to tell you on the other side of it is, yes, are there times in your life as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a business person, as a creator, that you're going to have to work your balls off and do 120 hours in a week? Absolutely. But if you do that week after week, A, you have now fucked up the thing you're trying to do, which is you're trying to do legendary work so you can have a legendary life and then it all plays together mm -hmm. and you've over-rotated onto one thing. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you're going to burn yourself out so that the innovation, the creativity, the company building, the, the closing of sales, the building of products, the things that you want to do, you're going to be so deep fried, you're not going to be able to do it. Oh, and by the way, there's all the health problems that you're now going to have because of it. And so this stupidity around hustle, this stupidity around grind is, is, is a plague on entrepreneurship. Mm. Yeah, it is. I think, um, I mean, do you think it's all bullshit from the Gary Vee narrative perspective? Because, I mean, why would he attract such a a youthful audience? I mean, I was in New York, when we were in New York, like four months ago, I was chatting to Howard Mann. He runs uh, uh, something called the, the Business Brickyard, uh, does a lot of coaching, sales, and all that kind of stuff, turnaround specialist. And and, and uh, we went for a, for a steak um, just near that, um, what's that really pointy building in New York, the really thin one? The flat iron, right. And then just on that little park there, there's a little steak place, which is, by the way, right near Gary Vee's sort of Vayner Media. Um, and so we got talking about him, and I said to you Howard, I said, you, you know. You didn't get any weird disease by getting that close, <laughs> did you? Did <laughs> nothing funny I started to grow on your finger or, God forbid, somewhere else? <laughs> well, I started using the word hustle a lot for no reason. When I was sneezing, yeah, exactly. I was like, hustle, I started hustle. getting a hustle twitch. <laughs> But uh, but he's got this pull on the youth in America, this aspiring young entrepreneur. You know what? Why why is he so attractive? If you're Look, calling BS on hustle, I'll give him credit for this. Um, I think it's great that he is telling people to go work hard because it does take hard work. But here's the aha: first of all, he's way over the top about it. Hustle's not the most important word in in in, in the English language. Love is you dumb fuck. Stop it, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. It, 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 one day this idiot will listen to himself. And if he ever actually listens to the shit he says, if he has an IQ, he's going to realize a lot of this stuff's bullshit. And by the way, I, I don't consume his stuff. So maybe he's, maybe he's tilting in the right direction. I, I, if he is, I wouldn't know unless somebody told me. Cause, and by the way, it's not just him. It's Grant Cardone. It's Ty Lopez. It's Ed, whatever the fuck got that MF CEO idiot. It's all of those guys, right? And by the way, if you want to know where all that stupidity started, all those guys are ripoffs of a guy named Tom Vu. He's Go that? to YouTube and type in Tom Vu. And he's the original infomercial shyster. And he's sitting on his boat 
literally it's it's hysterical it, it's like it's exactly like ty lopez he's sitting on some high big high speed boat with a whole bunch of women dressed in bikinis in the 80s and 90s you can tell by the hairdos and he says i came to america i only had one dollar i invested that dollar in real estate and now i don't know which one of these babes i want to have sex with it's just it's over the top I've- so here's what these guys are really selling what they're really selling is don't you wish you were famous like me? Mm. And I'm going to teach you how to be famous. And if you say, well, why are they popular with young people? If you look at the surveys, many, many surveys say the number one thing millennials want is to be famous. Kim Kardashian has over 130 million followers on Instagram. And I think the Kardashians are everything that's wrong with the world wrapped up into a couple of people. And all of these entrepreneur porn stars are are Kardashians. And the Kardashians and the entrepreneurial porn stars are selling the same thing, which is, look at how cool I am. Don't you wish you were famous like me? And they all sell courses about how to become famous like them on social media. And that's what makes them assholes. (laughs) <laughs> how is that <laughs> for rent but uh all right cool well i mean fuck sakes well let's talk about you then <laughs> hence why you're on the show um, assholes <laughs> let's let's go deep <laughs> but nice uh, transition let's go straight into let's go straight into into the personal aspects of what makes christopher lockhead christopher lockhead so i mean what motivates you today i mean you know podcasting you know, you're right. Are you writing a third book? I right? am. You are. Okay. What's motivating you today? I mean, if, you know, obviously you, you minted, uh, you got some cash to spend. Um, you got a great following. You, by the way, have a personal brand, despite what you might say about that. Um, and um, I'm just interested to know, like, what motivates you today? Despite all your success, why do you keep going? Why do you keep pushing on? So, you know, I've, I've gotten some real clarity about this in the last few years uh, from some wonderful friends. Um, and here's the aha. So I hung up my gloves as a CMO at age 38. And then I spent, you know, roughly a decade where I took a bunch of time off. And then I started a boutique consultancy, wrote my first book. Um, and then after, after Play Bigger came out, I sort of re-retired. I left the consultancy that I helped start with my uh, co-founders and co-authors. And I, I thought I was retired, and I used the R word. Um, and here's the aha. I think as human beings, um, if we're lucky enough to get to a place in life where, for the most part, you have your shit handled, the natural inclination, I think, you know, I've done a lot of work on this. I've studied happiness. We recently had, by way of example, Gretchen Rubin on the podcast. Mm. We recently had Amy, Amy Morin on the podcast. Uh, we just had Scott Galloway on the podcast, the author of the uh, Algebra of Happiness. And, you know, so I, uh, over the last 10 years or so, I've tried to get a black belt in happiness. Like what, what are the research-based things, not the sort of pablomatic bullshit, but like fact-based, research-based insights into what truly makes people happy? And my motivation today, Matt, is really simple. Have a very good time and make a very big difference. Mm. For me in my life, for much of my life, up until the last, you know, probably until my mid-30s, the question was, is Christopher going to make it? You know, my mother was terrified I was going to be a bum. Um, and I was on, I was on a good path to bum, bumness or bum ship. <laughs> <laughs> I was on, the, I was a pirate on the bum ship. Um, <laughs> and I made my dreams come true. I, I actually, you know, went past my dreams for myself. And I think when, when you wake up and you go, you know what? I kind of got my shit handled. Not that I'm perfect. I still have plenty of, you know, life is still life. But at least for me, it's, you know, what we talked about a little bit. If you get to the top of the mountain, throw down a rope. And so for me, writing and podcasting, um, doing the teaching that I do, um, you know, those sorts of things are my attempt to throw down the rope. 
Now, look, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm also trying to have a great time. I'm also trying to learn. The greatest thing about being a teacher is the amount of learning you've done. And so in the last uh, three years, I've learned more in the last three years than I probably learned in the last decade. Um, I learned things from talking to you. I learned things from talking to the amazing guests we have on the podcast and the amazing people that we talk to for the books, the research that we do. Uh, all of those things, right? I get to engage my mind in things I find fascinating and interesting. And I do it in a way that I hope I can um, uh, deliver it to people who have similar interests such that it makes a difference to them. So when you say to me off the top that my books have made a difference to you folks mm. and that it has helped you become the top startup in, in, in Africa, you know, if, if, if if the shit that I do has, has contributed half a percentage to some of the success that you folks are having, you know, what, what else matters in the world, right? We want, to, we want to be loved. We want to have a good time. We want to have great relationships with the people we're close to. And we want to feel like we matter and make a difference and make a contribution in the world. And the more you don't have to worry about yourself, you don't have to worry about a mortgage. You don't have to worry about, you know, as George W. Bush said, you don't have to worry about putting food on your family. So you've got sort of uh, good relationships. You've got some economic security and, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's normal and I think, frankly, it's healthy to turn your focus out, outward to the world. Mm -hmm. And for me, Matt, I make a difference in a very particular place. You know, I've sat on nonprofit boards and stuff like that. I, I'm not helpful in that world. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I make a difference. In the world of entrepreneurship, I make a difference in the world of marketing. I make a difference in the world of uh, category design and life design. And so that's where I apply my focus. I'm trying to learn as much as I am teach. And if I have a good time and hopefully make a difference, then, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Mm. Tell me something. If you could get into a time machine and go back to when you were that like on that uh, that bum train, you know, one way ticket to the world of bumness, <laughs> um, and more broadly looking historically, how much you've transformed, you know, as a as an individual and as a person. Um, when you look at that entire journey, and if you could get into a time machine and go back to like the beginning, when you found self awareness and what have you, and you look at your entire journey, what would you do differently? Is there one thing that jumps for you? Um. I think, you know, I'm just sort of thinking, I, I think um, a couple of things. One, I think I'd be a little more patient. You know, I am incredibly impatient and uh, I'm 51 years old today. And when I was 21 years old, I was exponentially more impatient than I am today. And so having a little bit of patience, understanding that um, time, you know, the Rolling Stones are right. Time is on our side. Time has always been a huge, uh, when, when, I, when, when I viewed it as, a, as an effective uh, tool for business and life. So I think there's some real value there and also being patient with people. Some people don't get it right off and, you know, I'm, I'm quick to judge. And so if you're somebody who doesn't get it, I kind of go, ah, oh, they don't get it. Go fuck themselves. Today. I try to take more of a, of a servant's heart, more of a, more, be, to be more kind, uh, to be more. So I think it's patience being a little bit more kind and being a little bit more trusting. And I think I also have, 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 uh, uh, gotten off the hustle train a lot sooner than I did. I think I would have given myself more breaks. I, I think it's not about balance, but I think it's about pacing. And the analogy I would use is if you look at an Olympic athlete, you know, we recently had the legendary, uh, um, the greatest beach volleyball player of all time, Carrie Walsh Jennings. She's one of the biggest athletic stars in the United States. She's won three Olympic gold medals. Um, and, and she's 40 years old and she's on her way now to Tokyo in 2020. And I, I think she's probably going to win another uh, gold medal with her partner, Brooke Sweat. And if you, so when you talk to a 40 year old elite Olympic gold medal champion, who's still competing at the highest levels on planet earth. And you ask her about her life and her routine and how she thinks and how she trains and her nutrition and all these things, what you realize is that you can't have the amps turned on 11 all the time. Mm -hmm. Carrie knows how to pace herself, how to train really hard at peak, come down, recover, compete, train hard, uh, 
will pull back on her training as she heads into competition so that she can be at her top, you know, so they know that they, how they need to peak heading into a competition, how they need to recover and, and back and forth. And there's this ebb and flow to life, right? It's, I don't think it's about balance. I think work-life balance is a bullshit paradigm, mm. but I do think it's about pacing. And so I would have been more kind, more patient, and I would have, I would have had better pacing. Mm. You mentioned your, your mother just now. Um, so what, what would you say has been the greatest lesson she ever taught you? Because obviously, I mean, I've, I don't know what you've learned from interviewing all these incredibly, you know, overachievers, I suppose, or just extraordinary people. What I found is that what ties them all together is their parents. Either they come from broken homes and that inspired them to, you know, stick it to the man or stick it to their mom or their dad or whatever. Or they just came from incredibly inspiring mothers or fathers that they just wanted to aspire to. So in your particular case, what was the greatest lesson that your mom taught you? If not your mom, your dad. Well, I, I think uh, my mom, Jackie, is a superhero. I'm the product of a... Of a, of a um, you know, a single mother. My, my parents were divorced when I was five years old. Mm. Uh, we didn't have much, but we, what we, uh, economically, but what we had lots of in massive abundance was love, was support. She made sure I was close to my grandparents, her parents. Uh, she made sure that I stayed close to my dad. And, and my dad, even though they were broken up, was still a, a huge part of my life and, and is still a huge part of my life today. Uh, she made sure I was close to my grandmother on my father's side. And I saw her work her balls off to provide for us, to keep us in the little apartment that we grew up in, to try to keep the piece of shit car that she bought running. And to, you know, um, as George W. Bush said, keep food on our family, right? Mm. Um, and so when you grow up in an environment where there's lots of love and yet there's lots of struggle, you get taught a lot. Uh, my mother had tremendous belief in me, uh, as did my father, as did my grandparents. My grandfather, Jack, with his Scottish accent, used to say, oh, you're the bestest boy in the world, you know? And mm -hmm. so they instilled love. They instilled confidence. They, they told me I could do whatever I wanted. They, they, they encouraged me um, to pursue the areas that I had interest in. Um, and so whatever went wrong in our lives, whatever we didn't have, whatever hardship was going on, the constant was, um, uh, you know, I know that my mother and father and grandparents love me. I know that they believe in me. And I always knew that. Amazing. What's one injustice that you see in the world that you'd like one? to see? One? I don't know. Pick one. I don't know. Pick one. Can't be Trump. Okay. I'll, Trump. I'll, I'll pick one that is, that is probably my biggest blanket one. It's 2019, Matt, mm -hmm. and human beings still kill each other over race, religion, and sexual orientation. And I just look at that and go, are you fucking mental? <laughs> and there is a mass killing in New Zealand at a synagogue. I wake up in the morning and I fire up my computer and I see that, and I'm man enough to tell you it makes me cry. When we recently had these mosque killings, I found out, I didn't know because it's, it's in a small house, that the Islamic Center of Santa Cruz is only a few blocks from my house. I didn't know what to do, Matt. And so the only thing I could think of was to bring flowers. And so my wife and I would bring flowers and put it on their doorstep. And so, listen, I was just on a fucking Facebook debate two days ago in Canada. Recently, the Canadian government, I'm originally from Canada. I was born in Montreal. The Canadian government um, has a dollar coin. And the Canadian government is, I don't know if they actually have done it or it's in process, but they're coming out with a commemorative special dollar coin celebrating diversity and celebrating um, the LGBT community. And I saw somebody on Facebook post how wonderful this is. And then I saw some asshole go off on it. And literally, not anonymously, he's using words like fruitcake. And he's saying, why are these people inflicting this on us? And how bad this is? 
and it's contaminating our children and that homosexuality is a function of, of bad parenting. And so whether it's idiots who don't get the LGBT community or assholes who kill people because of the color of their skin or the religion they believe in, I think that's the biggest injustice that I can imagine. And I pray for a world where each of us can be accepted on our true merits, independent of those things. And to get back to the different, Mm. the thing that makes us interesting Mm. is that on one hand, at the core, you and I are the same as human beings. What do we want in life? We want to have personal success. We want to care for our family. We want to be good providers. We want to be safe. And we want to have an opportunity to design and live the best life that we can have. And we want that for our families and our communities. And most people want that for the world if they have any kind of fucking IQ. And that's what unites us. And the other thing that unites us is we all want to be loved for what makes us unique and different Mm. and respected and admired for what makes us unique and different. And so there's a core similarity that we all have. And then there's a similarity around our desire to be accepted for what makes us us. My friend Hal Elrod, the legendary author who wrote The Miracle Morning, which I highly recommend, says, when you go into a new social situation, imagine you go to a party. What we first do when we walk into that party and there's people there, there, some of whom we've never met before, maybe we're at somebody's house we've never been to before, we're doing a calculation in our mind, which is, how much of my real self can I be here and still be accepted? That's what we all want. And so when, when people kill others in a nightclub in Florida because they're gay or, or, or they attack a mosque or they attack a synagogue or they kill people over their color or their race or their background, I scream at my browser. I scream at my TV. I don't fucking understand this at all. I cannot believe that assholes like this guy on Facebook are publicly out there saying the horrible things that they're saying about gay people. And I want to live in a world. I'm not saying there aren't assholes in the world. I'm not saying there aren't people who aren't good people. I'm not saying there aren't people who we should, shouldn't criticize. And you could be a fucking You know, you could be gay, but if you're a moron, then you're a moron. But we all want the same thing, which is the ability to uh, be judged on our own merit, to compete on our own merit, for people to view us as our character, not our color, not our religion, not our sexual orientation. We want to be judged on the caliber and the character of who we are, of not just our words, but our actions. Are we good people in the world? I believe you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. I believe you're either making the world different or you're fucking the world up. I I don't see a lot of gray. I know there are gray places, but for the most part, the people that I respect the most are the people who are working hard to make our world exponentially different. And I think the biggest thing we can do human to human, I think we have other problems. We got, you know, global Uh, climate change, and there's a whole bunch of other things. Mm. But the fundamental inequality where uh, people don't get a chance to compete fairly in the economy, people don't, aren't welcomed uh, into social situations because of the the, the quality of their character and and the results of their actions, as opposed to all, you know, all of the superficial things. That's, I think, the greatest injustice on the planet. Amazing stuff, dude. Couldn't, Couldn't agree with you more. Um, I just want to ask a couple more questions. By the way, yeah. Oh, it's not here. It's downstairs. Um, Nelson Den- Mandela is one of my absolute heroes. And um, he was on the cover of the New York Times in 1998. And there was this wonderful picture of him. And the headline next to his face on the cover of the New York Times magazine, Weekend Magazine, says, The Man Behind the Saint. I have that framed in my house. Hmm because he's one of my heroes because of that stand that he took. Yeah. He's a hero to all of us here as well, mate. Um, Yeah. And uh, he's definitely left a legacy, right? For, for all of us here. Gave us a future, which where we never, we were on a trajectory not to fucking have one. (laughs) Um, Yes. And the thing about Mandela 
that blows me away, which is the thing about every legendary person that blows me away. When you when so there are all the specific accomplishments and the massive contribution mm. to South Africa, to Africa, and I would argue, of course, the world that that man made. And here's the one that I think a lot of us miss, and this is why I love podcasting. Mm. Nelson Mandela took a poop every day. Nelson Mandela was a dude. It's very easy to put these people on a pedestal. And one of the things I love about doing my podcast is particularly when these giant giants come on the podcast, when you have an authentic, real, no bullshit conversation with them. If I go back to my friend, Kerry Walsh Jennings, by way of example, mm. what you realize quickly is, you know what? She's a daughter. Mm. She's a mom. She's a wife. She talked about the struggles that her and her husband, Casey, have had in their marriage and the things that she needed to change to become a better wife and a better mom. She wakes up every morning, too. There's a lot of mornings she doesn't want to train. There's a lot of mornings she doesn't want to compete. There's times when she has doubt. There's times when it's really hard to be as disciplined as she needs to be around her diet. So if, if you go back to Mandela, it's easy to put him on a pedestal and call him a saint. And I think he deserves those things for sure. But the mistake we make is when we say, okay, well, that then makes him different than us. What Mandela really teaches us, if it's possible for one human being to make that level of difference in the world, then it's possible for you and me. And so beyond the specific contributions, which I can't, which I believe cannot be overstated in the case of Nelson Mandela, the other piece of it for me is the inspiration around, well, fuck, if Nelson Mandela was able to do that, then what's possible for me? What's possible for Matt? What's possible for all of us? If Carrie Walsh Jennings can overcome what she overcomes, what's possible for us? Et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, the only thing about a Mandela is it's easy to create a mental separation between us and him because we have him on a pedestal. And what I love, if you read his, you know, his biography and if you read the books about him, Many of them break him down so that you understand this is just a man. He had self-doubt. He sat in that fucking prison for over 20 years, right? And, and it, there are many times he did not believe, right? There were, there were many times he was broken. That's true for all of us. And if he can rise up and take the stand, a nonviolent stand for making things different in a super positive way, then what does that mean in terms of what? we might be capable of in our lives. And even if we can't play at the level that he played, we can still make a big difference in ways in which we can make. And so that's the, that's the real inspiration for me beyond the specific contributions mm. of a man like Mandela. Mm. Yeah. It's, I've had that same kind of sentiment discovered or revealed through, through this podcast as well. You know, when you, you know, before when I first started episode one, we we're like obviously over 160 now, but when I was first sitting down with episode one, I really sucked at it. And then, you know, I was really, I'm an introvert. So I hated having conversations with people, or real conversations, authentic conversations like this. And then as the show grew, I started to be referred to some pretty big names in the business space here. And like I've interviewed all of the Shark Tank judges locally and billionaires on like four different continents. And the thing that, that, that happens is like before the interview, you get all like, holy shit, this is, guy, this is like legit. Like this guy, I can't believe this guy's actually making the time to speak with me. And you're kind of like, oh, my fuck, this guy's like, he's on a pedestal or she's on a pedestal. And then you realize about 30 minutes in or maybe at the end of the show, you realize that they're just ordinary people doing rad shit. You know what I mean? That's right. There's, there's no, no there's such no, thing as extraordinary people. There's, yeah. a, a, there's ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Mm. And then there's ordinary people doing mediocre things. And then there's ordinary people doing things that suck. And then there's evil people, mm -hmm. right? But they're all ordinary. Mm. Yeah, they're exactly right. We all take a poop every fucking day. <laughs> Everybody farts. Except for Sonal at the back there. She definitely doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's some gals who don't And fart. my wife. And my wife. She definitely doesn't. <laughs> but uh, Chris, let's wrap this up. Um, just a couple more things. 
do you want to tease in your your third book? What are you, what are you going to write about? Do you have a title for that? What can we expect? I think I think the book's probably going to be called Follow Your Different. Mm, I would imagine so, yeah. Yeah, because I I think one of the ahas I've had and and it really crystallized after Niche Down came out. Um the subtitle to the book is um How to Become Legendary by Being Different. And what I didn't realize was how much you know because both my books are business books they're 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 about category design they're about marketing they're about you know grow growth they're about scaling they're about entrepreneurial success they're about a whole new way of looking at at, at, at designing and building a business and a market and a category et cetera et cetera et cetera mm. and 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 in there are lots of sprinklings of personal things because I think you know, we touched it a little bit. This notion of work-life balance is bullshit. Mm. Matt Brown is Matt Brown. And, and there's use cases of Matt Brown, but your, your motivation in business is the same as your motivation when you're at home with your family, right? Mm. It's just a slightly different implementation, a slightly different use case. Mm. And anyway, so there, there, there's, there's things in both of my books that are, that, that are sprinklings of sort of personal insight. What does this mean for you as a human being, not just as somebody who wants to design a legendary business? And, and in particular with my second book, I couldn't believe the outpouring of sort of impact on a, on a heart level as opposed to a, a head level. Mm. Um, and so the aha that I've had is that a major source of pain for myself and for many of us is this feeling like we're misfits is the feeling like we don't fit in is the feeling like we're not accepted for what makes us uniquely us. And if you're somebody who has any kind of feeling like that, you know, I think at a high level, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who find their place in the world. And if you're somebody like that, I'm married to somebody like that. God bless you. I think that is the way easier path. But there are many of us for whom we can't find a place. It feels like there is no place. And if that's the case, we either crawl into our hole and become very depressed because the world is not accepting us, the business world or whatever world we're in, or we make a decision to make our place in the world. Or create it. And to create it, yes. And, and so what I've realized is there's a lack of thinking, there's a lack of discussion, there's a lack of dialogue and conversation around, if I'm somebody who can't find a place, how do I make a place? And, and that fundamentally is where this idea of follow your different comes from, which is um, it's your difference that makes the difference in your life, in your business, and ultimately in the world. It's the unique thing that Matt can bring that few others can bring that make you valuable, important, and frankly, make the people in your life love you because they love the unique things about you, whether it's mm -hmm. your attitude, your approach, your sense of humor, the way you think, uh, how kind you are with people, et cetera. It's, those are the things we admire and love about the people in our life. And so in a lot of ways, my mission now is a celebration of what's different and the distinction between the exponential different and the incremental better. And so my first book, Play Bigger, is very much about sort of for what you could lovingly refer to as biggie entrepreneurs. How do I design and dominate a category and try to build the next Google, mm. the next Cisco, the next, you know, whatever. Mm. And you raise a bunch of money and you try to go public and you try to do this very big impact stuff. That's very cool. That's where I've spent the vast majority of my adult life in Silicon Valley. The second book is really more for what you could think of as the smally entrepreneur. I want to open a pizza parlor. I want to have the most legendary corner store in my neighbor. I'm going to design and dominate a market category and dominate a three block radius because I want to have the most legendary corner grocery store in the history of our neighborhood. Uh, and so Niche Down is a celebration of, of those types of smally entrepreneurs. And the thinking behind... Um, um, uh, Folly or Different, uh, both the podcast and, and the book that we've started to work on is all of that at the personal level. Mm. How do I design my place for myself in, a, in the world? And how do I take my different and connect it to the world 
in a way that's valuable and important and hopefully fun mm -hmm. and, and, and highlighting the amazing people who have done that, who can be both on one hand instructive for us in a very practical way. How do I mm -hmm. make my own place in the world? And at the same time, also be inspirational. If, mm -hmm. if, 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 um, four star general Stanley McChrystal can do this, then maybe I can too. If NBA legend, Bill Walton can do this, maybe I can too. If Matt Brown and his colleagues can create the greatest fucking startup in all of Africa, well, you know, maybe I can do something cool with my digital business as well, et cetera. <laughs> we are the greatest fucking startup in all of Africa. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Preach that shit, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, last question for you, but I always ask this, uh, you may, you, you may have touched on this a little bit earlier, but, um, just sum it up for us. Why do you do what you do and what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's that reason? Yeah, I think it's really simple. Have a very good time and make a very big difference. Awesome stuff. Everybody, Christopher Lockhead. <laughs>